the Pope and Young Club wants to welcome you as we rally together to ensure our bow hunting opportunities for today and tomorrow. You've come to the podcast that believes in preserving, protecting, and promoting the passion for bow hunting. Join us as we strive to be the voice of today's bow hunter. This is the Pope and Young Podcast. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Pope and Young Podcast. I'm Jason Rouseville, joined as always with my co-host Dylan Ray. And today on the show, we actually have two, and, and you'll know them both, but we have two bow hunters with us today Join us. First one up, we have Alan Bolin, who is a current world record holder in the Sitka typical velvet category. So welcome, Alan. Hey, Jason, Dylan. How and, you guys doing? And we also have a, a man that probably needs no introduction, but I'm thrilled to get to do it. As we have Chuck Adams, who as of right now is the new world record holder in the Sitka Velvet category. So Chuck, congratulations. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I guess we are passing the torch today from one uh, uh, backpack bow hunter to another. That's, it is. That's and true. It's, it is. You look at this and, and you're looking at two guys who, you know, obviously very accomplished bow hunters. Um, you know, people know who you guys are. It's just, I, I mean, I was looking at this. I was like, man, they're both huge supporters of the club. And so I have been excited ever since I heard about the potential panel on your buck. I've been like, man, this is exciting. Let's see if we can get them both on there. So I'm really excited about this one. And, uh, you know, Chuck, how's it feel? I mean, you've had world records before. How many is this for you? This is my sixth Pope and Young world record. Uh, uh, the first one was uh, a Sitka Blacktail and Hardhorn in uh, 1986. And, okay. Uh, I'm happy to say it's one of my two favorite animals. Uh, elk and Sitka deer are my two favorites. So uh, That's... that makes it especially sweet. You're like Tom Brady. You're going to need more fingers for all the world record rings. <laughs> <laughs> I hope, I hope you're right. <laughs> yeah. And now, now Alan, you're, you're no stranger to world records because you've had some too. So how many world records have you had? Well, so I, this is my first official world record. It was in, in 2005, I shot a mountain goat that uh, paneled above the world record, you know, when I shot it. But during okay. the same recording period, another one also paneled above the world record. Okay. And it, it was shot six months after mine. So uh, it wasn't technically uh, a world record. So, yeah, this was the first. You know, the first one only lasted six months. The second one lasted a year. So what, so, what do you do? <laughs> you know, based on that, you, you know, your next will stand for two years. If it that just would be, doubles that would every be cool. time. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? What a testament to... You know, not only you guys as hunters, but but also just, you know, you always hear about the good old days. And holy smokes, man, two world's records in in this, in the Sitka Velvet, just in the last, that's just phenomenal. I mean, it's a testament to bow hunting in general and the wildlife populations we have out there available to us. That's a good point. That's true. Uh, it is a new category with Pope and Young, but I will say both of these bucks, uh, Allen's of mine, are awesomely big for that category, uh, hard horned or velvet category. So yeah. it's not like we sneaked in in the bottom here early on. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, it's about the easy winners a lot of times with these Sitka deer. And uh, we've had quite a few of them. Yeah. There, there's, some, there's some big bucks out there. Yeah. Now, the so antlers, Chuck... uh, in my experience, the antlers will vary 10 or 15% in size from year to year just based on how much snow and cold there was the winter before. Okay. Oh, really? Interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. So was this a buck that you had identified and you were chasing? Was this a, an opportunistic, you know, time? Tell us a little bit about the hunt. Well, it's kind of funny. Uh, I, I, even a blind ac hog finds an acorn once in a while. And uh, I'm always, this was my 18th trip to Alaska for Sitka deer. I just love it up there. Uh, I landed, set up camp, went out the next morning. This was the first deer I saw on the trip, not the first buck, but the first deer. 
Uh, wow. I didn't even, I was in, I was climbing in the high country and I wasn't even up there yet. And here he was lying in a swale about 125 yards away. And you could have scraped my eyes off with a stick because uh, he was bedded facing away. The wind was right. And I thought that's a four by four with good brow tights. <laughs> and uh, long story short, I uh, circled around and got him about an hour later at 36 yards. But uh it was the very first deer I saw. In first trip. deer you saw. Now, see, as Dylan knows, that is the only way I would ever kill a world record is if it was the first good buck I saw. Because I, <laughs> I don't have the patience you guys do to pass. Uh, I know Alan's passed. I mean, you guys both have passed up, you know, hundreds and hundreds of animals in your career. And I just don't have that patience. So, you know, if the bow hunting gods are listening, hey, I'm okay if it happens just like that. I don't need to, you know, like... 18 day hunts or anything. I'm okay with the first buck I see being a world record. Alan just so, got your blessings because at least the Chuck Adams took your record and not a guy like Jason, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's true. You know, how disappointing would that have been if some yokel like me took it? And <laughs> Jason, if you count up, if you count, if you add in our world records, then there's still only seven world records on this podcast. Yes. So, you know, that's a pretty good average. Though. We're almost at two per yeah. person. Yeah. So if we, if, if we dump Dylan off right now, we'll be over two per person. That's pretty good odds. So uh, no, it's interesting, exciting. Chuck, it's really interesting how that happened. Um, I've always been one who says that you never walk into an absolute giant. Like it just doesn't happen. You know, I, I it's really until this hunt, because my story was similar believe it or not. Until this hunt, I've always, you know, glassed them up from a distance or through a long period of grinding it out, I've located a, a really big animal. But this this particular hunt, we we hiked into the subalpine. I was in Southeast Alaska and we got weathered for a couple of days and the weather kind of broke and we put on our full packs and we were going to move to the other side of the ridge. And we were moving through this spot where I knew there were quite a few deer um, from having been there before. And we saw some really fresh tracks and we came up over into this meadow and it wasn't the first deer I saw, but he was in the herd, the a herd of six or seven bucks. And um, so I, I saw this herd and then I, I identified him in the herd as well. So basically the first deer I saw and with full packs on moving to the area we planned on camping, um, it just, it just never, I don't know it for me, it doesn't ever happen that way. And this one time it did. So literally that, you know, the first hunting morning of our hunt, um, I dropped my pack, crawled in on him and shot him at 14 yards, like, you know, 45 minutes later. So it's funny, both of these bucks were on our way in and the first ones we had seen pretty cool. You just never, just a... you just never know what's going to happen. Uh, uh, four of the six, uh, the world records I've taken, uh, I did know they were there and I hunted them for several days and uh, mm -hmm. I had a pretty good idea how big they were. And uh, Ernest Hemingway, the great late author, said one, one time, some animals are earned but not taken and some animals are taken but not earned. Well and, said. Uh, I earned this deer afterwards because I hunted for almost three weeks to take fill my other two tags. But uh, this, this deer was like a gift from heaven. You know, That's I, great. I just want to point out that you guys say that, but I think it's just a testament to how much work and understanding you guys put in before you ever get there. Um, yep. you, you know, you're right. Normal guys don't just walk into a world record, but you guys put in months of planning and, and, and scouting before you ever step foot on the ground. So, so you're stepping foot into some of the greatest territory because you've already put in the work uh, to figure out where those spots are. And so I don't think it's any coincidence that two of the hardest working bow hunters that I know are two of the most successful bow hunters that I know. There's something to be said for that. There's there's no luck involved here. This is years yeah. of preparation and experience meeting opportunity. Right. That's what this is. And well, you the, need to research for sure. And uh, I think Alan, he hasn't told me where he got his big deer, but I have a good idea. If I looked at the Pope and Young uh, list, I'd, I, I sure I'd know where. Pretty close. But yeah. uh, we, we, we hunted the two best spots for big Sitka deer in Alaska. Uh, about as far apart as you can get in, in the deer territory, but uh, that was not by accident. Yeah, it's I, nice going you know, into a place where you know there's at least the possibility of a giant. I don't, I don't like hunting anywhere where it's there's not at least a chance. I would agree with that. 
Yeah, Dylan, we need to get these guys. We need to talk to Garmin. You know, they're now they're a corporate partner. We maybe we need to get these guys some Garmin watches for Christmas or something, and then just like backdoor, hey Garmin, just let us know where they are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, technically that would be research, right? I don't know. You already tipped your hand. It's too late. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late. Yeah. So no, that's hey. You know what? Here's the fact of the matter. I could be on the same ridge top as you guys, and and I'm still not in your league. So it's uh. It, it's exciting to get to hear about it and, and uh, you know, just help experience it or you guys helping us experience it, um, reliving it for us. So, Basically now what, what saying, we got to live vicariously through them is what you're saying. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. So, now, Chuck, what were your other? So, this is number six. What were the first five? Well, my first ever was a Sitka Buck. Uh, in 1986, uh, 108 and 4.8s. And uh, the second was a uh, Coos Whitetail from Arizona. That was 110, I believe, in 5.8s. Uh, the third was a Mountain Caribou from Northwest Territories. Um, it was around uh, 410. Uh, the fourth and fifth, I shot the same year, two, the year 2000. Wow. Uh, the new American elk world record from Montana and the new uh, bison world record from Arizona. Wow. That's a year. Yeah. It was, a, it was quite a year. Yeah. The elk, the elk grow scored over uh, 430. And that scored 409 and change. And the uh, bison was uh, a, a touch over 118 inches. Hmm. All just monsters. Yep. So that's a, uh, so, so Alan, now you know you've got there there's the uh the numbers to beat. So you've got a few years <laughs> now to make to get your next five. Well it's yeah, getting I, harder and harder to get those is. records because the scores keep going up. So uh to get one in this day and age uh, for Alan or me is is quite a feat, I think. So you yeah. guys you guys there's uh I mean, you know, I, I don't I don't mean to put Chuck on the spot here, but uh there there's a for me personally, there's a lot of history here with Chuck and his world records. I, I read, you know, your book, Chuck, Life at Full Draw, I believe was the name of the book, um, which I guess it wasn't your, it wasn't an autobiography. It was a, it was a biography, biography, but you biography. obviously cooperated and gave a lot of information for the book. It was really, really well done. And, um, and when I read about Chuck's accomplishments, it was the, the, the start of the fire that sort of inspired me to aim for greatness in bow hunting. Um, when I look at back and, you know, Chuck and I have, you know, said hello a couple of times, but, you know, we, we, and we've communicated um, electronically as well, but, you know, we're not close friends or anything, but I will say, even though, and I, I would hope someday to become close friends, but even though we don't, you know, we're, we're not communicating all the time, Chuck has been extremely influential in my life in in the way that he's bow hunted i've always looked up to him and um a lot of the things he's done has kind of opened my mind to the possibilities and uh when i read in in that book about how chuck shot this big sitka black tail deer it was kind of the seeds of what i eventually i told myself someday i want to go out and 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 shoot a really big sitka black tail deer and um and I think that would be a lot of fun. And I started my research and I, and I ended up setting it on Southeast Alaska instead of Kodiak. But, but, um, I wanted to do, I wanted to do that. I was, it became a dream of mine because it's one of those animals that you can do on your own and over the counter tag, and you can do your own research and you can, you know, get dropped and go and go chase, chase without any, without any restrictions. And I just thought that would be amazing. I wrote an article for Bowhunter Magazine about the hunt. And I mentioned Chuck in the article, in the Bowhunter Magazine article, and what an inspiration he had been to me. So that's just extremely ironic to me, how all of that started that way. And then after, you know, hitting my goal, my dream of shooting this giant buck, Chuck is the one who comes in. And, and I think it's awesome. I think it's so cool that, that Chuck then comes back and, and, um, and you know gets the world record i i I think it's amazing 
you know, quite a coincidence. I read that, I read that article in Bowhunter. Uh, you and your son Jake had a good time on that. And, uh, yeah, it was it was a blast. Uh, yeah, and uh, I've been trying to break the Sitka World Record for uh, over thirty years. Uh, I just keep going and looking and looking, and uh, uh, it was uh, awesome to finally lay eyes on a deer that big again. Good because yeah. there are not as many big ones around as there once were. The 1980s were the probably the best time for mm. really big bucks. Really. So, th- so those of you listening, here's how it happens. Like when Chuck Adams just lucks into a world record, it's because he's done. He's hunted hard for 30 years and they're just lucked into it. That's how yeah, this works. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, you know, you know, Alan, you mentioned things coming full circle and and you know, Dylan and I were discussing this earlier, is even this, you know, what we have is, is I look at it, and I think you were one of the very first, when we started this podcast, uh, it'll be a year next week. Um, I think you were the the first or second person we had on. Number two. Number two. And, then, and so it's come all the way around. So here we are at, at week 52. Next week will be a year. And I'm number two again. You're number two again. But in at a different time, way. you were number one. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, same thing with you, Chuck, I think you were leaving cause we had you on the podcast a while back and I think you were leaving like the next day to go on this hunt. And so it was, you are, it was really to, close. It was really, yeah. Close. So we talked to you right before it. And, and so, you know, I'm thinking we must be good luck, Dylan. I remember calling you Jason, uh, because Chuck posted and said, you know, I've updated, I shot a nice black tail and I called you and I'm like, dude. If that score is correct, that just beat Allen. Yeah. And uh, I said, and we had joked because I tried to go with Chuck and he told yeah. me. Um, yeah. And we had joked. I'm like, well, man, I should have went. That could have been me. But uh, yeah. But yeah, it was, it was, that was cool. Yeah. That, that well, was we're going to have to do another podcast uh, late in, in early August next year. Okay. <laughs> you got yeah, it. The yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Of course, Alan's on, might be on that one too. So then we'll really have a problem with that. Uh... Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> hey, you know what? We we enjoy doing them, and we have a lot of fun with them. And especially, you know, for stuff like this, what a mm-hmm. what a neat, you know. And nobody wants to have their world record broken, but man, if you can, you know, if you have it done by somebody who has inspired not only yourself but tens of thousands or, or hundreds of thousands of bow hunters out there in the world. Wow. I mean, you know, Chuck Adams broke my world record. That's kind of cool. That's, you know, it could, it could happen again. I mean, Alan might go to Southeast Alaska and, and bust this one uh, this yeah. next summer. You never know. <laughs> you know, we I don't, I don't have a trip plan. I bet, but, I bet he's going to try. Yeah. I bet he's yeah. gonna try. He doesn't have a trip plan. I don't have but, one planned. It's only know. Monday. Or, or Tuesday, I guess. Technically. <laughs> so, you know, give him a couple of weeks. It might be on his books and maybe we'll just, you know, guys, let's just make this an annual thing. You know, next year, Alan, you can break the record. And then the following year, you know, Chuck can break. We'll just do it every year. That sounds like I'm, fun to me. I'm up, I'm up for that. Okay. <laughs> so what is, uh, so I'm going to ask you guys both, what is the next world record you're chasing? So, Chuck, which which is up next on your list? I know you you know you've been working on. You know, I really years. don't chase world records that that much. The Sitka deer was always in the back of my mind, but uh, I just hunt for the challenge, and I try to get the biggest critter I can, and uh, let the chips fall where they may. My two favorite animals, as I said before, are elk and Sitka deer, and you can bet if I'm able, I'll be going after both of those every year. And big mule deer, I love big mule deer too. Yeah, uh, I don't think there's a chance, not even a one percent chance, anybody's going to break the world record on purpose on mule deer, but uh, or elk at, at this point. But uh, yeah, uh, if it's if it's the biggest thing I saw and I was uh, able to uh, get an arrow into him, I'll be happy. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, you know, in your opinion, what's the next one that's going to fall? Boy, I don't know. Uh, they're all, all, the, all the uh, world records are up there pretty high for score at this point. Uh, the velvet category has a lot of openings. The velvet category is newer, yeah. and, and so that's probably the best chance, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, I was even, I was looking at that, and I think there's some, like, velvet moose and velvet elk. It looks like maybe there's a couple of opportunities there. So, 
it's right. pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, you look at that and, you know, you see the, the white tails, you know, the non-typicals that, that were just uh, there in the last year or so, and it's just tremendous. And then you look at, you know, the typical buck has stood for what, 50 some years. And that, mm -hmm. that one you just look at and you're like, wow, how long can that possibly make it? So yeah. it, it'll be interesting. You know, if you look at the internet, it gets broken about six times a week, but uh, <laughs> right. so, somehow those score sheets never make it to the office. Right. There's yeah. definite shrinkage. There's definite shrinkage yeah. there. Yeah. So, so Alan, how about you? What's, what's the next one you're chasing? You know, I, I have this, uh, have a dream to do a Boone and Crockett caribou slam. Okay. That I've, with your I've got bow. with the bow, of course. Yeah. 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 And so I have three of the five and, um, and I have the Baron ground awards book, but not all time. So, so, but I saw, I want to redo that one, but so I have three all time and then one awards book. And then one, I I've never shot a mountain caribou. So I, I, I've kind of, I kind of get, you know, I kind of get focused in on a species and I just, I learn everything I can about it. And I go back every single year and I just, dump all my time and resources into trying to figure that out and, and until I succeed. And then I, I, then I get sidetracked. So like, I don't even have a Sitka blacktail deer hunt planned. And I don't know, I don't know when the next time I'll go because I, I kind of hit my goal of shooting a big one. And, and so now I'm onto the next, onto the next yeah. little obsession. So I think, uh, I'm, I'm kind of on the caribou obsession right now. I I've been, and I've been on that for over 10 years, obviously with, with three booners, in the, in three of the five species, it took an obsession to get that far. And now I'm going to continue that and see if I can get that done. Yeah. What are the two you have left, Alan? Uh, mountain and, and barren ground. Oh, okay. All the right. two big ones. I started with the smallest Chuck because I didn't want to be the, disappointed. The woodland, the woodland. Yeah. I started, I went literally from the smallest and I worked the, my way up to the largest because you know, you, you don't want to shoot a 420 inch bull and then go shoot a 300 inch bull. And, and, and yes. like, it's harder to get excited, you know? So yeah. You're lucky to get I, that Quebec Labrador. I know. I was very lucky. I shot, shot it, it down. on the last year on the last hunt, Chuck. That's wow. awesome. Yeah. yeah. It's, you know, Again, four leaf clovers in your pocket. Yeah. Right? That's right. <laughs> and and Dylan, I'm, I'm hearing these guys talk about, you know, like, ah, you don't want to, shoot a, a big one and, and be disappointed both of these guys i've seen mule deer they've taken which are um, humongous and then they're shooting you know 109 inch blacktails and they're still looking pretty happy to me yeah no that's true that's so, true that is it's, true uh, yeah it, it's uh that that's just so much it, to to have the knowledge of so many species just blows my mind. It's just like wow, you know, because each one is is unique and different. And, and uh, so is mountain the next one on the list? Is that where you're going this year? Yeah, I'll probably go on a mountain and a barren ground hunt both next year. And um, okay. I, I'm on a, a a doll sheep obsession too. I've I've spent 66 days now hunting doll sheep in my life. And I've never seen a ram I want to stalk. So wow. I'll, I'll continue that. That's, that continues to be a, a big investment of time and money. And, you know, yeah. but I really want to kill a giant doll sheep. So I'm, I'm willing to, even if it takes me the rest of my life, I'd really like to do that. The way I look at the 29 is I'd rather, I'd rather die with 15 big ones than 29 species. Like, I, that's just how I look at it. And I, yeah. and I, I don't want to rush through it. Like everyone I cherish that, that I want to, mm. I want to like hunt that species until I find the one that just makes my eyeballs pop out. And, and that's, that's how I look at it. A little different, but it's, it's what I, I think it's fun that way. Yeah. So how many, so, not, so how many legal doll sheep have you seen and not even considered putting a stock on? 23. <sighs> that's three. See, he, Dylan, he wants some that make his eyeballs pop out. I've got glasses, so that's probably why my scale's a little smaller. <laughs> you know, like I, I'd so I just want to shoot some Pope and Young stuff. You know, I, I've, I don't even most of these. I'm not even sure if I've seen you know Boone and Crockett quality animals in some of the stuff I've chased. So that's, 
That's uh, I'm gonna blame it on the ice. Gonna be really tough. That one, it's I very think. difficult. Uh, yeah, my I have hurts, one that's a words book. I have a 386 official, but mm-hmm. you know, but I've never seen a 400 incher. I thought that one was when I shot them, but you know, 15, after, 20 years ago, you would have probably found that caribou that's going to be really tough now. I think you're totally right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, I, and I've already what? been on, I've, I've spent 30 days so far you know, <laughs> looking. Days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I look at my hunts so that way. I, I'm the people say, are you disappointed that you came back empty handed on your hunt? I'm like, no, the hunt's just getting started. I'm only 30 days in. It's been 30 days over several years, but it's still the same hunt. This is one hunt, you know. One hunt over three decades. That's, That's right. A- That's right. That's, uh, yeah. Whew. Once again, so I'm probably not going to shoot many world records. Because so I'd be like, oh, Chuck, that one's legal. You you have, is, uh, sorry, I'm trying to remember, is is your mountain a world, was it a world record? My mountain caribou was a world record. It was the mountain. Okay. Yeah. The mountain caribou, right. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Where did you, what province did you shoot him at? Northwest Territories. And uh, I actually thought that was a breakable world record. And I hunted 10 straight years uh, to get that caribou. So I, I remember that story. The same page as you. I didn't, I didn't hold out though. I shot several mountain caribou along the way uh, toward <laughs> the end of those hunts. But uh, finally, I found the really big one I was looking for. That's great. You know, part of the problem on the doll sheep is Alaska, there's a four year waiting period. So a lot of those rams I've passed, I, you know, I would have shot had there not been a four year waiting period. Mm-hmm. Oh, if you harvest one, you have to wait four years to go again. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Wow. 66 days and counting for dolls. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's some dedication right there. It's been fun. All, all Alaska, Alan, or are you hunting other places? Um, I've started to hunt the Yukon as well. Okay. Yeah. I have two hunts in at the Yukon. Um, and one of these years in the Yukon, I'll shoot a ram. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't want to, I mean, who, life's too short. I could get in a car accident and not be able to hike anymore and be like, well, I wish I would have shot a doll sheep. So I, I should do that one of these years. They, they don't have the four year wait there either. They don't exactly. Yeah, That's the, that was my yeah, point. Yeah, in Alaska, I, I I won't shoot unless he's what I want because I don't want to have to wait. Mm-hmm. But yeah. willing to wait, just don't want to have to wait. Right. <laughs> yeah. Willing to go back four years in a row, you just don't want to wait four years to go back. No. That's that's great. So, um, so Alan, obviously, you know, last year you shot that Sitka world record what was what was your season like this year this year i actually had the worst season i guess of my life i mean you know i i had a lot of fun but i i did i shot a brown bear on kodiak in the spring and this fall i have not shot a single animal wow yeah i i mean i i went on a doll sheep hunt and and passed a couple of really nice rams one that was probably close to 160 and then um and I went on an antelope hunt and um, I missed a bunch of shots. Um, I, I had some check out my advice on antelope jumping the string on, on, but these were a little bit longer shots and maybe that's. Hey, uh, Al, Alan, you, you broke up on me there. What was that? What, what was that? What happened on the antelope hunts? I, I apologize. On the antelope hunt, I missed several shots. Oh, okay. I, yeah. I just. I thought it was my headphones because I'm like, I, oh, I get I you. That, I get you. I don't think Alan misses many shots. No, I did. I missed shots. I the those animal I, they were jumping the string on me. This this spot in Utah I was hunting is extremely flat. It's like cow pasture and it's flat and there's no grass. I mean, it's really difficult to stalk. So I was taking some longer shots and 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 but they were gone by the time the arrow got there. Uh, and uh, it was it was a little. I mean, I had fun. Whatever. It got a lot of stalking, a lot of hunting, and then um, and then I did a couple of. I guided a couple of hunts this year, so that took some time. And then um, I've been whitetail hunting. And anyway, it's it just hasn't. Whatever. It's just one of those years. I get, yeah. I mean, obviously, I could have shot things if I wanted to shoot things, but I'm really picky, yeah. and it just I I didn't connect a single time. So wow. that's all right. Yeah. Chuck, you had a good fall, didn't you? 
I did have a good fall. I uh, bagged three Sitkas uh, in Alaska and uh, two nice pronghorns uh, in Wyoming. I can get two buck tags normally here and uh, uh, on a 360 bull elk. Uh, and uh, I just got back from Alberta, Canada about a month ago, shot a nice milder up there. So uh, very nice. Had a lot of fun, saw some nice critters. It was your, uh, your elk in Montana? Elk was in Wyoming. Oh, in Wyoming. Yeah, my, my home state of Wyoming, yep. Very yep. nice. I did not draw any Montana tags this year for the first time ever. That's a I shame. I almost always get an a archery-only antelope tag up there. And I, I didn't get a deer tag, an antelope tag, and the elk tag's really tough now. When Steve That's Felix shot that uh, monstrous world record a few years ago, everybody started putting in for Montana who hadn't thought about it before. And it's like a one in four, one in five chance now, uh, which makes me sad. There's some great elk up there, but uh, we've got some good ones in Wyoming. Yeah. And I agree with you. Antelope are the string jumpiest things. That's the whitetails that I've ever hunted. Uh, if they're not rutting and really preoccupied, I don't like to hunt out of uh, blinds for antelope. Uh, if you're in a blind and, and, and encapsulated, uh, the sound of your bow doesn't carry very well and you can mm. uh, do pretty well. But if you're spotting stalking, they, they, you know, they have track shoes on. That's terrible. Yeah. I was very frustrated. Do you do any, do you compensate at all? Like aim a little, I mean, I had, you know, everybody gives you advice, right? No, man, you need to aim a little forward or, or somebody was telling me you need to aim a little backwards because they turn when they jump the string, do you do anything like that? Or you just shoot straight on? I used to try that. It never worked. Yeah. It never yeah. worked. Uh, I just follow through and hope they stand. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's all I, you can do. Uh, you know, if there's a little breeze blowing and, and some cover, uh, it rustles and that helps. Uh, if they're really preoccupied with the doe, that helps, but uh, it's difficult. I actually prefer to shoot an antelope farther away rather than close up. Close oh. up has been has been worse for me. Mm -hmm. you know, if I sneak within 20, 25 yards, I think they're more likely to jump string than, Interesting. than say 40 or 50 yards. You know, I, I shoot a, a mechanical broadhead that has four blunted blades in the front, and then mm -hmm. I shoot a, a strong helical. And I think my arrows are extremely loud. There's a lot of drag because of that, like that, that broadhead actually, it doesn't plane at all, but it's mm -hmm. like, like, you know, at shooting compared to a field point at a hundred yards, it, it's six inches low from the wind drag of the mm -hmm. blades. And so I think they're hearing my arrow in the air. It could be, if it's uh, dropping that much, the arrow is definitely hissing through the air. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, and, and they're a lot faster than any arrow. Yeah. You know, if they hear, if they, if they hear that arrow 10 or 15 yards in front of your bow, they're going to be gone before it gets there. It doesn't even look like they're trying when they get out of the way of the arrow. I mean, it was like no effort, and that arrow, arrow hits yeah. the dirt. <laughs> well, I hunted an antelope years ago in Montana that I called uh, uh, Weird Boy because he had one horn that went back dramatically, and the other horn went front dramatically, so I knew exactly what I was after. He jumped string on me twice out of his bed at, at like 30, oh. 35 yards. And and my arrow hit the bed both times, and he had to be 15, 20 feet away when that arrow hit. Wow, serious. And I never got it. I never got that ammo. Oh, I man. Still, I think that was like 20 years ago, and I still think about that guy. You're making me feel a lot better. I really appreciate it. I know. That's they're, they're <laughs> yeah. they're, they're I was talking to somebody, and he said on an antelope, he said he, the thing was facing to the left, and he actually hit it. He said it was a great hit, but he said it went in on the right. He said the antelope like did a 180 and he just happened to get lucky and made a good shot. But uh, that does not surprise me. I, I've done that on white tailed deer before. I've never done it on an antelope, but uh, wow. I think they're in the same category for string jumping. I mean, they have reflexes like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I got to do my first white tail hunt this year out of a tree stand, and that was a lot of fun. Got to see a, a lot of stuff, and I have a new, I don't know if I'll call it appreciation, but a new recognition of the amount of noise squirrels can make in leaf litter. So <laughs> I'm like, is that a herd of elk coming in? No, that's just a squirrel over there. Okay, all right. So, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, so, so Chuck, 
I know you've got uh, some goals as far as record book. Where are you at? Do you, do you know your total number right now? I, 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 I do because like we talked about in the last podcast, uh, I broke 200 uh, Pope and Young Animals and I finished last year out at 203. And so I shot seven this year. Uh, the three Sitkas have been officially scored. The two antelope, the elk, and the uh, mule deer have not yet. I'm just waiting until the mule deer hits the 60-day drying period, and I'm going to have them all scored. But they're all nice animals, so I would imagine I'll, by the end of the year I'll be at 210. That's awesome. My goal, as I told you guys uh, last year, my goal uh, was to um, – well, I say last year, it seems like last year, but it was just last August when we had a podcast. Um, uh, my goal years and years and years ago was to somehow break 200 Pope and Young Animals uh, just for the challenge of it. Well, now I'm looking, trying, I'm looking at 300. And, and, uh, <laughs> I, think, I think it's possible, actually. Uh, I think so. Yeah. 300. At the pace yeah. you're at. Yeah. yeah, it's possible for Chuck Adams. I'm not sure yeah. if possible is real, but yeah. And I, and I want to emphasize it's not it's not so I could say I got 300 or 200 or 210 or whatever. It's because that's the challenge for me. You know, it's that's like right. Alan. You pass up animals, you pass up animals, you pass up animals like you didn't when you started bow hunting. Uh, but as, as time goes along and you feel more adept, you want more challenge. So you start passing stuff up and looking for bigger animals. And uh, it's a personal goal with me. You know, I don't care if anybody else knows it, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. At the core of maybe... bow hunting, at the core of bow hunting for me is, is challenge and adventure. I mean, it's yeah. just like, you want to be challenged and, and there's different ways to do that. You mean, challenge yourself physically, whatever. But when you all of a sudden say, you know, I'm going to take an already difficult sport bow hunting and then put more requirements on it. You know, there has yeah. to be a certain age or a certain size or whatever. And, and, you know, people are always, what is it about the size? Is it about the trophy, whatever? Well, I don't know. I mean, yeah, they look cooler when they're bigger, but the point is it's much harder. It's much more of a challenge. Not only are they more rare, which is probably the biggest part of the challenge, but they're, they're smarter. And I don't know, smarter, but they're, they, they, they have better habits, habits that have sort of selected them to survive. And now you have to overcome those habits. And so the, the whole thing of, I guess that's one of the things I saw when, when you, you've inspired me over the years, Chuck, is you've taken bow hunting and turned it into a huge challenge and, and succeeded at, at accomplishing some pretty amazing things. And it, it makes the sport more fun. And that's one of the reasons I love the Pope and Young Club, because when you measure something, and, and when you measure anything, any type of result, you measure a time in a marathon, whatever it is, when you measure something, it adds depth and challenge to it. And it, it makes it very fun for me. I, I like yeah. the country too. When I saw that picture of you in Boner Magazine glassing, yeah, uh, chills, chills went down my spine because I just love that high alpine country. It's and beautiful. I looked at that picture and I thought, man, I can hardly wait to get out there again. Like Alan did in that picture. Uh, yeah. It was just awesome. Just awesome. Well, if you want to come check out Southeast sometime, let's go. I, you know, I have. Have you? I've been, okay. to, I've been, I've been to Prince of Wales Island, and yep. uh, uh, I didn't like it that well, to be honest with you. But I only was there one time, and I didn't hardly see any deer, and I probably saw one that would break the hard horn, horn world record for Pope and Young, but he was like two miles away, and I never saw him again. And uh, uh, it, it, it just. I like I like uh, Kodiak Island because there are a lot more deer there. You might not see big ones very often, but there are a lot more deer. Well, you said two things in that sentence that don't live well together: Hardhorn and Prince of Wales Island. Right. Yeah. You have to hunt them in the velvet in the Alpine. Well, I was there in mid-August, and and in, oh, in, 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 on Kodiak, oh, you're saying okay, on okay, Kodiak in mid-August, everything's velvet. Yes. But, this was mid-August on Prince of Wales, and this deer and three others I saw that same deer were all is that they right? were all hard horned already. Oh my now, gosh. Maybe it varies from year to year and yeah, yeah. all that kind of stuff. But I, I was actually kind of blown away that it, that deer had stripped his velvet already. Yeah, that is amazing. I haven't seen that, but I, yeah, it does. I've heard it varies a lot, even like when 
when the horns get hard, you know, I've, I've shot deer on August 5th that had soft tips and that also had completely hard pointed tips and Mm -hmm. it's the same date. So yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah. But I don't have much to compare with because I've only been there one time. Yeah. Then I went back to where I liked to have liked hunt for years. So yeah, why not? Right. You've had great success. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Can't, can't knock it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you had to pick the one spot to hunt this year, what would it be, Chuck? I guess you get one, one hunt. The one hunt, it would be elk. Elk's my okay. all-time favorite. I mean, an elk brings everything to the party. Big antlers, great meat, great scenery, uh, uh, bugling and, and grunting. And it's just, just the most exciting thing I've ever done. Yeah. Uh, so that would be it if I had to pick one. Unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to have to. So yeah, well, <laughs> not not if you're putting seven a year in. That's that's, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So and that and it hasn't been that long. Like you said, we we talked not even four months ago. I don't think. And right. And you're you're seven more since then. So same thing, Alan. If you had to pick one one place to hunt, what would it be? Yeah, I I have to get a backpack hunt in every year whether it's sheep or, or, a you know, a, even the Sitka black tail deer or some of the caribou I've hunted have been in the mountains of Alaska. And yeah, as long as it's, you know, any of those or mountain goat, same thing. If, if I'm living out of my backpack for 12 days and I'm getting worked physically and mentally, and I'm, you know, dealing with weather and seeing beautiful country and getting stuck in my tent and getting soaked and all those different things. I just, I love that. I yeah. love it. So I would have to say Alaska or the Yukon. Okay. That's yeah. I've been doing a lot of research and I've seen, you know, some of the videos you've done with the Kuyu guys and different things and, and, uh, the the backpacking is a whole nother element that I just haven't delved into. And it's, it's an acquired taste. Yeah. It is. I'm not sh- I'm not sure everybody has a, has the taste for it. You know, it's I don't know that it's for everybody, but man, some guys just love it. And it's the guys that do it like that and love it, man, they're successful. So you've got to be a masochist to do it. Right. Yeah. Uh, like Alan just said, you're wet, you're cold, you're tired. Yeah. Uh, uh, the ground is harder than it is in a, in a lodge uh, by far. And uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, it's, there's no better way to find really big animals because, like you just said, not too many people do it. So you yeah. can get into places where uh, very few human footprints have ever been. Yeah. Yeah, I was looking at it and I'm like, man, I, how are these guys backpacking? I think between the propane tank and the unit and, <laughs> you know, even if I found water on site, I mean, my, my, uh, camp shower still got to be, you know, 40 pounds just for my shower. So I'm not well, sure how these guys are. When I backpack, I don't take propane when I backpack, it's trail mix. And, uh, yeah. uh really? Oh yeah. You go cold. You go cold. I go cold. I go cold. Oh, wow. Light. Cold yeah. and light. Yep. Uh, every, every ounce counts. Uh, no, it's, it's the lightest way to go. Absolutely. Yep. I have to take it. I can, I can, I can eat well out. after I get back. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Uh, what, how long do you typically go between resupplies? Uh, probably 10 days, two weeks. Yeah. yeah. 10 days is 10 days, two weeks that the, um, I've, I've gone cold before on the food and I start to go crazy. That that's that in itself, it takes a lot of mental fortitude to eat trail mix and candy bars or whatever for, for 14 days. <laughs> well, I'm so focused. I don't even think about it. It's just uh, fuel for the furnace and that's oh, it. Oh my gosh. I love this guy. Yeah. I love this guy. I know. <laughs> and the thing, as you know, Alan was sick a deer in particular, you hunt from daylight till dark. You don't oh, long days. You don't you don't take a nap in the middle of the day because, like with elk, they're they're bedded somewhere where you can't go. Uh, uh, the days are long in in uh, August in Alaska, and uh, you hunt for eighteen hours a day. And, yeah. and so I don't I really don't think about the food. So what is you know walk us through a typical day at it when you're out there hunting sick deer, Chuck. A uh, typical day, I get up at uh, daylight, uh, 
throw my pack on with some survival gear and a little bit of food. And uh, uh, if I'm not bivouac hunting, sometimes I'll hunt, have a base camp every day and go out maybe 10, 12 miles and then come back. I mean, round trip, 10, 12 miles, sometimes 15, depending on the terrain. And uh, uh, I carry my arrows in the backpack and hip quiver and uh, a spotting scope and just cruise the country and, and look and look and look and look and look. And uh, if I'm lucky, I'll see some bucks when we're talking about Sitka's to uh, uh, size up and decide if I want to go after them or not. Uh, if it's a true bivouac, uh, I'll put on about 60 pounds in a pack with enough trail mix to get me by for X number of days. And a uh, uh, really small backpack tent uh, and and uh, a thermo rest uh, for the ground and, and a lightweight sleeping bag and just go and, mm -hmm. and stop wherever wherever the day ends. And so when you're I, I, sometimes it's as much as 10. 10 or wow. 10 days is about as much as I did work at a time. This is so yeah. much easier said than done guys. Like oh, yeah. if, if, I mean, I don't know. I, until you've actually done what Chuck's talking about there, you don't, you don't understand like how mentally and physically taxing these type of trips are. And there's just these days, there's so much. And I, I mean, I don't mean to throw anybody under the bus, but there's just so much BS on social media and so much, regurgitated information about, you know, this is how you do it. This is how you, you, you do these really tough remote hunts and all of this stuff. And I'm telling you what Chuck just said there, the way that he does that, I'm telling you right now, that is legit. I mean, it's you're every single day, you're getting like five hours of sleep and, and you're hiking all day long every day. And, and he's not even, he's not even treating himself to a freeze dried meal at night. You know, <laughs> this is like, true focus of uh, somebody obsessed that obsessed trying to find you know trying to hit their goals and to go after what they love to do it's it's awesome to hear that is absolutely yeah. it's, it is, it's inspiring it is. yes the, 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 the my first world record the hard one sitka from 1986 uh, i was with a buddy i usually hunt with a buddy and we go separate directions uh, for for one you know a day at a time or multiple days but uh I headed out and I climbed for nine hours through the olive brush to get to the outline. And then I was up there for three days before I got that sick of buck. And uh, it was pretty brutal. It rained every day. And uh, uh, so not only was it pretty Spartan, but it was pretty wet too. And then you have to carry the meat out. A big sick of deer will produce about 60 pounds of boneless meat. So you have to carry that out plus the head. And uh, so it is difficult. Alan knows all about that. I mean, he, he's a diehard, obviously. And uh, you don't you look at that picture in Boner Magazine, you know he's diehard because he's a long ways from a the road there. Yeah. See, now right there, Chuck, I think you just said probably, I know you love elk hunting, but what you, that sentence you just said is probably the most uh, logical reason for hunting Sitka blacktail instead of elk is boned out you've got 60 pounds of meat to put on your back <laughs> versus with an elk you go that far back in and, and you're making three or four trips it's, a, it's well, a different game the problem is you also heard that his normal pack is 60 pounds 60 plus 60 plus head is 125 yeah. and that about breaks the man on the way out that's it's lot. all it's all you can do it's lucky it's usually downhill yep yeah yep. if you if you had to go up and over uh it's very not much, possible. It, it would kill you. It would yeah. Kill you. Yeah. Yeah. And my, that that trip, my bush pilot put my good hiking boots in the float of his plane. And I was getting organized, didn't realize he didn't take them out. And I did that whole hunt in regular old non-ankle support uh, rubber boots. Ooh, and, I oh. and I took a, a roll of duct tape with me. And when I got back, I was walking more on duct tape than I was on rubber. Uh, wow. so, so that was even harder that particular trip. are you saying because you were covering the blisters no i'm saying because the boots fell apart. oh gotcha yeah. oh yeah. yeah okay i was wearing two pairs of socks as always i don't i don't think i've ever had a blister on my on my feet oh nice um, because i wear two pairs of socks and i have tough feet but those boots literally fell apart from from Jeez. all the walking so it was uh, they held more water inside than outside yeah. by the end huh 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, all these guys, you know, it's all about the challenge. Hey, yeah, I shot a world record, but I did it hiking, you know, 14 miles a day in rubber boots. <laughs> so that, <laughs> that's not normal. I, I, I always yeah. have to see that my hiking boots are with me. Uh, that, since, that would uh, be what, yeah. So that would be one of the first things I would put on my list. Okay. What are the things that I absolutely have to have decent footwear is right. it would be at the top of mind. I wonder what went through that pilot's head when he got back to his dock and he sees these boots. He's thinking, ah, he probably doesn't need them. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I why would imagine. he bring those out? You know, like, yeah. Oh, that's, you know, those guys, they're, they're, they're air taxi guys. They just throw it out on the dock and you grab the next client and that's it. So yeah, Jeez. he didn't even know I mentioned to him when he flew back in, it didn't even ring a bell with him. Hmm. Really? Yeah, you would think on stuff like that, it would. But then, you know, it, it's also different up there. I mean, people, like you say, people use airplanes up there like we use taxis or Ubers down here. Well, if you were so. a taxi, if you were a taxi driver in New York City and uh, somebody left something in your cab, you just leave it at the station and go on and not think about it. I think it was the same yeah. way at that time. Yeah. Yeah. I think the guy's like, check this out. I got Chuck Adams boots. <laughs> <laughs> I I make a point of never telling anybody who I am when I go on these hunts. Uh, sometimes they recognize me, sometimes not. But uh, yeah, uh, I don't like to let them know because if I do get a big animal, they might tell somebody where we were, you know. And I'm yeah. sure Alan's the same way. Nobody's yeah. going to know where my honey holes are uh, yeah. unless they torture me. Yeah. yeah, it's on a need to know basis. Garmin. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Our friends at Garmin. Yeah. They, yeah. We, we know about your Trojan horse gift. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I'm going to take my time next watch, and that is it. <laughs> hey, you know what? If time, if you've been using Timex watches to get it done, uh, maybe, maybe I need to switch to a Timex. <laughs> They keep on so, ticking, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, guys, I'll tell you what, I, what an exciting story. And it, it really um, couldn't happen to a, to a better guy and, and a bigger icon for bow hunting. And so, um, you know, Chuck, congratulations on a new world record. That's another new world record. That's just outstanding. Thank you, Jason. I, I want to congratulate Alan on all his successes and, uh, he shot a big buffalo not too long ago, which I really admire, and uh, because I love bison too. And uh, uh, to take a sit as big as he did, I, I feel kind of sad that I beat him in some ways. No, come uh, on, not totally. I'm still yeah. Crazy, but, uh, <laughs> but I mean, I, that was an awesome deer. And if it hadn't had some deducts, it would be mine because I think it netted or, or grossed about one sixteen, didn't it? Yeah, it had a two and a half inch extra. Yeah, that's yeah. what I thought. Yeah. yeah beautiful buck but chuck really in all sincerity huge congrats to you i oh, mean thank you. you've had a, such an epic career and you know it, to to do it again like it's just and i i believe there's another one there coming so it my just, favorite number is seven so there you go i'm there keeping my fingers crossed yeah right. if it doesn't happen i'm gonna have a heck of a lot of fun trying that's right yeah yes which is well, the most important got, thing yes yeah. for sure well, guys, you you both have been on the show before, and since we're uh, since this is the last episode of our first year, we can't change anything now. So, the one question we ask everybody is: When you're out hunting, what is the one thing, maybe non traditional item, that you can't live without? So, you know, Alan, you had the world record first, so we're going to start with you. Um. I want to say, I want to give you something good, but I, I'll say I, I usually take a solar charger um, okay. with all the electronics these days. I, you know, I, I like to have my inReach, my sat phone. I like my music and my books and all of that stuff. So I like to have a solar charger these days. And I found this brand on Amazon, Big Blue, that crushes okay. it. it. It's like a very really? good solar charger and it's cheap, but yeah, that's, okay. that's a good item to have. What size? Do you take on something like that? It's it's it weighs like um, thirteen ounces or something like that. So it's not it's not bad. I mean, compared to like the batteries you'd have to carry, you do need right. one one battery, 
to hold the, the charge, right? So you can transfer it then to your other devices. But, but you know, on a two week hunt, you would have to carry quite a bit of batteries. And, and Chuck's probably like, you, this sissy generation, man, they need their electronics. Are you kidding me? But it's just, I'm pretty connected, you know? And so I, I need, I need that. And, and so I think, you know, there's a lot of people that, that need power on their hunts and it, it, it is pretty handy. Is it? There's, some, know, the awful, there's some awful solar, solar chargers out there, by the way. Awful. Like, which, like such as, such as I'm not going to say the brand, but the biggest brand is terrible. Okay. Terrible. Really? Yeah. And so like every time a cloud passes over, it has to be unplugged and replugged in order to restart it. But I leave mine out all day long while I'm out hunting. Right. Right. So it can't be re anyway. So, um, I believe, I believe it's 20 Watts. 20. I, okay. I think so. I think it's 20 Watts, but anyway. Yeah. That's, I was just curious. I, I've already looked it up. Yep. Yeah. That's the one. That's the one Dylan. 28 Watts. 70. 28 Watts. That's right. 28, 28 Watts. Yep. Okay. And so, well, that's a good tip. I like that. Cause I, I recently got some solar stuff and, and uh, tried that out at my elk camp this year. And it, it, it worked with mixed results. I think I was mm -hmm. trying to use a, I was trying to use it for charging up a, an e-bike and I just didn't have quite enough juice for what I wanted. That's to tough do, to but. charge. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I've been, I was on Prince of Wales, completely fogged in where I can only see 20 feet. I mean, it's so fogged in. And I put that thing outside of my tent in the fog and I'm, I'm like reading books or whatever on my phone and my phone, this is completely fogged in. My phone is holding charge all day long and never dropped. Wow even a percent that's pretty amazing in the complete fog yeah no that's a great that's a great tip yeah. and chuck say, same question for you well it's going to disappoint alan but i do have quite a few of the gadgets with me all right <laughs> I, I do in reach and i have a sat phone and i have a a good battery pack to recharge uh i take traditional books uh, i read read the paperback books uh but um I think I told you guys four months ago that uh, I used to carry a, a clinometer with me to j judge the angle of the shots. And you, you usually get angled shots on places like Kodiak Island and Prince of Wales. And um, now I've got a good rangefinder binocular with a mode that gives me the exact angle of the shot. And I guess what I do that uh, I don't know anybody else who does, I have a formula in my head for uh, once I know the angle and the distance, I can figure out how to aim. And the arc uh, functions in these things do not work with a bow. Uh, you have to hold lower than you would if you believed your arc function. So I have a formula that compensates for that. Uh, I run it, run it through my head very quickly and it's worked for me for decades. Um, and uh, I would encourage everybody to try downward and upward shooting with the standard arc modes and range finders. And I think you'll find that it doesn't work that well. You're going to be hitting over the top way too much unless you compensate even further. Works great for bullets from, from rifles. Not so well uh, with bows and arrows. What's okay. the formula, Chuck? Uh, what I do is I take the distance and the angle and I subtract seven degrees from the angle because that's, the difference between my arrow angle and my eye eyesight angle. Um, and then I convert the rest to percentages and I subtract that. So if I had a 27 degree shot, I subtract 20% from the distance of the shot and it mm. works great. It works so a uh, 45 degree shot, you'd subtract, you'd, or a four, say subtract 47, 38. 38. 38 degrees from the shot. And it does thirty eight percent percent of each. Yeah, thirty eight percent from the distance. Yeah. From the distance. So, so it's a fifty yard shot. You're going to uh, subtract um, uh, seventeen yards. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Have you written an article about that yet? I've always kind of kept that on my hat, to be honest oh, with okay. you. I, I, and, and one reason is. I think it varies with the speed of your arrow. Mm, and uh, yeah. so I always try to shoot about the same speed arrow and it works for me. But I suspect if you were shooting faster or slower arrows, you might have to tweak the formula. 
Yeah, Let's, that makes sense. It also depends on where you anchor with your uh, uh, bowstring hand to your face because uh, line of sight versus arrow angle is different for everyone. Mm -hmm. What what speed is your arrow that that works for? I I shoot pretty slow arrows. I'm I'm shooting heavy arrows. I shoot arrows uh, over six hundred grains for a lot of stuff, and I'm shooting about two fifty. 250 mm -hmm. feet per second. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Now I, I've got some barn burner setups too. I mean, I've got setups that shoot well over 300 feet per second, but uh, the, the 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 formula I just told you about is for a 250 foot mm -hmm. per second arrow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Well, that's that's a new one. And I'm going to guess if you had to pick a second thing that you'd make sure you take on your hunt, it'd probably be boots. <laughs> absolutely yeah good yeah. boots good boots <laughs> not rubber boots yeah yeah and a bush pilot that pays attention to detail yeah. yeah 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 that's there's a bunch of guys you know probably sitting in the tree stand still wearing rubber boots right now in the midwest you'll be like boots what's he talking about you know my rubber boots work just fine yeah so well, when you go when uh, you go when you go 50 60 70 miles over rough terrain it's not very, very nice on rubber boots. Like yeah. Know. Jason, it's funny you mentioned that because I'm a big preacher of, of a hundred percent leather or uh, uh, rubber boots. If you're whitetail hunting, uh, not even like a neopre neoprene upper, uh, because leather and neoprene will hold scent. Um, and so when you walk into your tree stand, if you have all rubber boots on, you're not leaving scent where you walk. Um, so I'm a big proponent of wearing rubber boots, not in the mountains though. <laughs> Yeah. No. Well, you got to understand these were just camp rubber boots. They weren't ankle uh, fits. Uh, yeah. I mean, if I'd had good quality ankle fit rubber boots, I'm sure it would have been fine. But these things uh, were not designed for that. Right. Yeah. Wow. Well, guys, once again, thank you so much for uh, all you do for for bow hunting and for Pope and Young and and we really appreciate both of you being on today and uh, and everything you do to to promote our sport and inspire you know inspire generations you've been inspiring generations and you've got more generations to come for for both of you because i know you're both out doing it so thank you both very much for joining us today we really had a great time visiting with you thanks guys thank you jason thank you dylan thank you alan it's all right. good to talk to all you guys yeah. thank you all